Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. This is The Takeout. It is October 11th, somewhat late in the evening, because these are tumultuous times in Washington. There's still no Speaker of the House of Representatives, and we're going to try to find out if it's possible this week to shed any light on when that might actually happen. So we came to the Longworth House office building, the office of Mike Lawler, 17th District, New York. Mike, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Major. Is there going to be a speaker this week? I'm not sure. You don't think so? No. Why? I, I think I think there's still a lot that the conference has to really Republican conference. Yes. This is re a Republican problem. It's a Republican problem, but Democrats played a role in it. Of course they do. Um, we, in my opinion, we never should have been in this situation. Never should have sacked Kevin McCarthy. No. And I think uh, in my conversations with some of my Democratic colleagues, I think there's some regret that they played a role in this. When you look at world events, as we've seen over this past weekend uh, with the situation in Israel, this is why you don't play politics with this stuff. Uh, why you don't create institutional weakness correct. in the middle of a congressional term. Correct. Listen, if Kevin did something that actually warranted removal, A fine. crime, if he had murdered fine. someone or shoplifted or but, done something. But to remove a speaker in the middle of the term. For keeping the government open. For keeping the government open with bipartisan support. And then the Democrats go and vote with Matt Gates of all people, who they believe is unfit to serve in an elected office, to me is wrong. And, and I get it's easier said than done, and I get the politics of it. I've been around this a long time. I started as an intern for John McCain back in 2008. So I get it. But let's be real. This was an opportunity, frankly, for Democrats to say, we're not going to be party to this. We're not going to play a role in this. If Matt Gates wants to do this, go do it. If you can get 218 Republicans to agree with you. Mm -hmm. He couldn't. He had eight, it was eight Republicans total teaming up with 208 Democrats. Right. And they removed a duly elected Republican speaker. Yep. And so now we have a crisis, a constitutional crisis, uh, and, and a situation where, uh, given uh, what is happening in Israel, obviously Congress is gonna need to act. We're gonna need to increase aid. We're gonna need to uh, add a supplemental to uh, help the Iron Dome, the funding for the Iron Dome. Uh, and you know, we need to be cognizant that- look, None of that is possible while this house is in a s situation in which it is not operating, which it cannot do without a speaker. Correct, we're paralyzed. I mean, look, we went through 15 rounds in January and as uh, the American people saw, you couldn't do anything unless you elected a speaker. So now we're back in the same boat. We need to elect a speaker. Uh, and frankly, right now, nobody has the path to 217. And that's a challenge. It's My fun. audience will have heard, well, wait about this, Steve Scalise, he won the vote within the Republican conference. For an hour or so on this day, October 11th, his people were saying, we're going to go to the floor of the House and vote. And then they said, no, we're not going to vote. What happened? This was the, the problem that many of us identified. Uh, the, the majority of the majority doesn't rule anymore. We had, throughout the course of the year, about 20 people uh, who refused to accept the will of the majority of the majority. And in different ways, whether it was the speaker vote in January, whether it was taking down a rule on the House floor, or whether it was bringing the motion to vacate, uh, they felt that they could control uh, the floor and control the majority uh, by holding everyone hostage. The, and the, so what we tried to do... The tail wagging the dog. Completely. And what we tried to do in this vote for Speaker was to say, let's make sure we have 217 votes. And if we don't have 217, we better not leave this room. And so there was a rule that was proposed to do that. And Steve Scalise and his team whipped against it and, vo and, and ultimately killed it. Uh, and then they won a majority of the conference vote, barely. 113 to 113, 99. right. Uh, with uh, eight people uh, voting for other candidates, and three people voting present. Uh, and so you're talking about 113 to 112. And so at the end of the day, what you end up with is a situation where the conference is not unified. Not even close. Correct. And so our whole point, 
in saying, let's make sure we have 217 before we walk out of this room, was you better be able to get on the floor and get 217 because we don't need a repeat of January. So let's walk through this. You're saying Steve Scalise should have locked the doors. I'm saying Steve Scalise should have listened to the room. And even though the, the, the uh, amendment got killed within the room, he should have understood there was enough people that he needed every single vote to get to the floor. Right, but sometimes to forge a deal, you have to lock the doors and say, we're not leaving until this is settled. And, and after, what, what, happen you after what happened in January, after what happened last week, yeah, you need to hash this out in private. You need to be able to have that honest dialogue. And I think, uh, frankly, over the last week, and I've been very frustrated and disappointed and angry about what happened to Kevin McCarthy. It never should have happened. Kevin McCarthy did a phenomenal job representing this conference, uh, this party, uh, and this country as speaker. And he should not have been put in that position. But Matt Gates and seven other members teamed up with 208 Democrats to do it. And we should have recognized as a conference that you need 217 and the only way to get there is to stay in the room until you hash it out and everybody says I'm voting for X on the floor. So Mike, my audience will clearly get from what you just said about former Speaker McCarthy that you count yourself among his allies. You mm -hmm. are a public defender of his. You believe he was worthwhile, as you said, for the country and the party and the conference. Let's tease out what you said a couple of moments ago, that maybe Democrats are having some regrets. They would have asked for some concessions from mm -hmm. McCarthy if they would have agreed. It would have been a highly, highly unusual thing to do. Yeah. It would essentially topple all partisan instincts of the last 50 years, not to mention yeah. the more deeply partisan instincts of the last five to 10 years. They would have extracted something from Kevin. Could Kevin have given the things, not all, but some of the things that you know Democrats would have demanded and maintained his ability to lead the House? They were looking for uh, an even split on the Rules Committee. Right. It's nine and, to four now. Yeah. And the Rules Committee is, frankly, what, what governs the House right. in terms of bringing legislation to the floor. It's really important. That was not going to happen. It was, an unreal, it was an unrealistic ask. But it was and a big ask. It was a big ask, but it was unrealistic. In extremis, you make asks I'm like a that. member of Problem Solvers, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a meeting uh, prior to the vote, and a bunch of us made it very clear. He can't make that deal. And Ask for something else. He, he can't make that deal. What if the Democrats and had asked to stop the impeachment inquiry? Couldn't make again, that deal either. Again, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think there was too much he could have made as part of a deal. I think what I would say to my Democratic colleagues was this. Given where we are in, a, in the country, we're a very divided country. And frankly, with each year, it's getting worse. I'm, one, I'm in a district that Joe Biden won by 10 points. That is 70,000 more Democrats than Republicans. Today, there's about 35 districts that are actually competitive. A decade ago, it was about 70. So when you look at that construct, that means there's 400 districts in this country that are not competitive that are very partisan. So our, our politics has obviously gotten much more partisan. And then what I would say to my Democratic colleagues is, look, at, at this moment, this was an opportunity, frankly, when you talk about protecting democracy, when you talked about preserving our institutions as they constantly talk about, this was an opportunity to actually do that. And to say, you know what, Matt Gates, we're not gonna be part of this. But they teamed up with him because they thought it would give them a political advantage in the next election to create this chaos. Yeah. And then, chaos. then four days later, Israel is under attack. Right. And this is why you don't play politics when it comes to this stuff. We're going to get to the chaos part in a minute. We're in the office of Mike Lawler, 17th District of New York, segment two of the takeout in just a second. It was served up on a platter for them and they're going, wait, we have an opportunity to eliminate the guy who's going to fundraise against us? Great!
Welcome back to The Takeout. Mike Lawler, Republican, 17th District of New York, is our special guest. We're in his office here in the Longworth House office building, continuing the conversation about chaos. Who are you going to support? Will you support Steve Scalise? Right now, no. And part of the reason uh, that I'm not is because I think we need to have an answer of how we're going to govern going forward. Uh, I won a district that Biden won by 10 points, that has 70,000 more Democrats than Republicans. I got elected because of the issues, spending, affordability, crime, the migrant crisis at our southern border, the challenges internationally, China. Uh, those were the issues I talked about that I ran on, that I won on. People want us to govern, and we need to be able to do that going forward. Uh, and so we're going to have to we're going to have to address that, and we're going to have to deal with the fact that we have to get to 217, 218 and if I on hear any you, issue. If I hear you, Mike, what you're saying is we not only have, you Republicans not only have to get to 217, but it has to be a bankable, durable 217, not subject to a tantrum of Correct. four to eight to 12 members of your conference and repeat this cycle, this Cor Congress. Correct. Look, we're in a divided government. The American people elected a House Republican majority. They re elected a Democratic Senate. And we have a Democrat in the White House. And so we're not going to get everything we want. No. And you have to recognize that when you're negotiating. Kevin McCarthy understood that. And he did the right thing by the American people. He avoided a default on our debt, and he avoided a government shutdown. Because he was willing to negotiate, he was willing to come to a, a compromise that was in the benefit of the American people. Right. And that, to me, if he, if he got voted out because of that, right. that's wrong. And we'll get to that in a minute. But what is happening as we speak this evening, late in the evening, October 11th? Has Steve Scalise contacted you personally? I met with Steve tonight, okay. uh, earlier tonight. We Did a, you tell him what you just told me? Yeah. That you're a no? Yeah. Okay. We had a very How do you frank, take it? Look, Steve's a professional. He's been around this a long time. He's a good man. I, he's I heard like, yes and he's heard no. I, he's, he's been a whip. He's been a majority leader. He's been, you know, uh, in various leadership positions. He's a good man. I don't have a problem with Steve personally. Uh, and I think, obviously, this is a man who has survived yeah. a gunshot wound. Yeah. Uh, six years ago, he's uh, battling cancer Blood right cancer now. cancer now, yeah. He's a strong, uh, tough leader, uh, and I respect him. Uh, but this is about the conference and the country and how we govern. And I think we need to get to a point where we are doing what is in the best interest of the American people. We are holding people to account, whether it is within our own conference or whether it's the Biden administration or the Senate. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to uh, focus on the issues and the challenges facing the American people. Right. That is what is most important. Let me translate this. this, if I can, for my audience. What you're saying is those who ousted Kevin McCarthy have to be broken. They have to be brought back in into a functioning Republican coalition and not threaten either Steve Scalise or any future speaker with ousting, correct? It's pretty straightforward. Right. How does that happen? What does that look like? What's the path to that? Look, you have people like Matt Gates, who's very smart. If anybody's ever talked to Matt Gates, he's a smart guy. But I feel he uses his smarts uh, to do wrong and not do right. And I think if he actually used his, his intelligence to do uh, good by the people, good by the conference, good by the institution, uh, he would be a force. But when you, when you uh, are focused on undermining the institution or undermining the conference because of personal petty uh, reasons, it's wrong. And so, to me, somebody like Matt. But Matt can't do this by himself. Others have joined no, him. No, no, no. He had seven Republicans and 208 Democrats. Democrats can act like they had no part in this, but they did. And when you look at that fact, you have to get to 200, and in this case it was 16 that removed the speaker based on the number of people who were absent. Um, 
I think there's a lot of regret by a lot of people. All right, let me ask you this. Is there any scenario, as we speak again, late in the evening, October 11th, where Kevin McCarthy comes back as speaker? I wouldn't write it off. Why? Because I think the reality is he did a great job. He, What's his he path was, back? Look, Kevin, Kevin is our strongest uh, fundraiser, messenger, strategist, fundraiser, uh, and leader. Which is, of course, why the and, Democrats and you, voted you to take him off the of field. Of course, they were happy to take him off the field. I mean, literally, it was served up on a platter for them, and they're going, wait, we have an opportunity to eliminate the guy who's going to fundraise against us? Great. You know, I mean, this is so foolish. It is the single most destructive thing I've ever seen politically. Uh, and I've been around this 15 years. I started as an intern for John McCain. Like, uh, this, to me, is, is the craziest thing I've ever seen. So, of course they were going to do that. I would expect nothing less but from, what's Kevin's from a path political back? standpoint. Look, somebody has to get to 217. And as it stands right now, nobody can. Kevin was at 210 on the last vote. I think there is an understanding, uh, now more than ever, that doing something like this is destructive to the country. When you see Israel attacked by Hamas, a terrorist organization backed and funded by Iran, and we are now in a situation where we have f almost 600,000 American citizens in Israel, in a war zone. You have a, a situation uh, at our southern border, which is a total calamity. Six million migrants have crossed our southern border, most of them illegally, since Joe Biden became president. The mayor of New York City says this is a disaster for New York. It will destroy New York, quote unquote. The governor finally saying there's no more room at the inn. We need to stop this massive influx at our southern border. This is a crisis of policy decisions being made. And we, as Republicans, as a House Republican majority, have an obligation you want to, have an answer. to serve and to govern. Mm -hmm. And I think there is pressure building on folks, especially the folks that voted for this, including the Democrats, to say, how are we going to fix this? So you, Mike Lawler, are telling me on October 11th that it is possible by the end of this month that Kevin McCarthy could be Speaker of the House again. I wouldn't write it off. And uh, 10%, 20%? I wouldn't put a percentage at it. I would, I would say it's a, it's a reasonable possibility because he did a good job. And he, he, has, he, he has the removed. most votes of anyone currently yeah. competing for the job. He shouldn't have been removed He's in closer the first than place. Anyone. He's closer than Scalise is what you would say right now. Yeah. But he didn't throw his hat in the ring. He's tried to tamp this down. Is that real or is that just, is no, that just Ke for the look, moment? Kevin, Kevin is an honorable, honest guy. And I, and, and I honestly, you know, there's one thing for me as somebody who's been in this a long time. I care about one thing, my integrity. And when I see what happened to him, I think it, I feel bad because it was wrong. He didn't deserve that. And so I, I look at this and obviously he wants to do what's best for the conference and the country. And so he took a step back. You know what? Took me 15 rounds. I just got motion to vacate first time in our history. I'll take a step back. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's anybody they can get to 217. And the rivalry between him and Scalise is real. Look, I, I, I think uh, anytime you uh, are dealing with leadership one and two, there's always some friction. That's, that's a reality of life. President, vice president, there's always friction. Um, I, I, I think both are honorable men. I think both are good men. I think both are trying to do what's right by the country. Um, but I think Kevin McCarthy is the right person to lead this conference and lead the House of Representatives. That is the voice of Mike Lawler. We are in his office in the Longworth House office building. When we come back, we're going to talk about Israel and Hamas and Iran and lots of other things that have now been thrust into our consciousness in unexpected, de deadly and dangerous ways. I'm Major Garrett, segment three of The Takeout in just a second. My constituents go to Israel on a frequent basis. Right now, I have hundreds of constituents that are there.
Welcome back. Mike Lawler is our guest, a uh, freshman member of Congress, uh, kind of a giant killer. Uh, he won over Sean Patrick Maloney, the head of the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee in the 17th District of New York, among the most noted victories for a challenger in the 2022 midterm elections. So he is formidable in his own right, uh, at least based on that result. Um, what feels to me like the best way to describe what Israel is confronting right now is something that is cataclysmic. There is a cliche in around the hostilities long running between the Palestinians and Israel cycle of violence. This does not strike me, Mike Lawler, as a cycle of violence situation. It is bigger, deeper. It will affect the psyche of the state of Israel for the next 30 years, if not longer. What are you most interested in seeing from the Israeli government and from the Biden administration? You know, I visited Israel uh, earlier this year uh, in May for the first time uh, and got to go to uh, all of the historic sites in Jerusalem, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, the Western Wall, the city. Been there three times. It never, never and it was spectacular. fails to impress upon you. Yeah, all was, the history and everything. It was spectacular. And, and the proximity and the tininess and the neighborhood. Every, everything. And, and I was there with Speaker McCarthy. It was his uh, first trip as Speaker uh, overseas. He spoke before the Knesset for the first, uh, for the first time since Newt Gingrich as Speaker. Uh, and uh, it was the, we were there to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Israel. I represent a district, the 17th District of New York that is uh, one of the largest Jewish communities in the country. Now, I'm Irish, Italian, Catholic, uh, but um, this is a district uh, that I've lived in my whole life. And my constituents go to Israel on a frequent basis. Right now, I have hundreds of constituents that are there that are trying to get home. Uh, and so when I see uh, and what happened. the majority of those constituents have dual citizenship status? Many, many, many do. Many but do. not all. But do. not all. Right. But not all. But many do. Mm -hmm. um, but when I see what happened, it was barbaric. It was outrageous. Hamas is a terrorist organization funded and backed by Iran. And they must be uh, eliminated, period. Their objective and that of the Iranian regime is to eliminate Israel from the face of the earth, period. They don't believe the Jewish people have the right to practice their faith, and they don't believe they have the right to do it in Israel. Correct. And so we as a country, we as a government, must be firm and resolute in our support of Israel. Uh, the idea that we have members of Congress who try to create this moral equivalency between the Palestinians and Israel and what happened here. You had women, children, babies being beheaded. It's disgraceful. It's disgusting. And any member of Congress that can't denounce that unequivocally and clearly should not be a member of Congress. On that point, do you distinguish between Hamas and Palestinians who live in Gaza? Yes, of course. Of course. And, and look. And you understand the privations that those Palestinian civilians do live under in Gaza? Oh, they live under oppression in Gaza, under Hamas. The occupier but, is Hamas, from your point of view. Oh, absolutely. Not Israel. No. And that's the problem. Some of my colleagues think Israel is the occupier. But... Look, you had Hamas invade Israel, rape, assault, murder, thousands of people, injure them. Over 20 Americans dead. 22 is the latest number. Potentially 19 hostages. We have an obligation to stand by Israel. Harry Truman recognized the state of Israel within 11 minutes of its founding. We made an oath. We owe it to the state of Israel to stand by them, 
to allow them to defend themselves and their right to exist, period. When the Biden administration says at the microphone, as it has this week, that Iran is broadly complicit, but initial U.S. intelligence reports do not establish a direct linkage, what does that mean to you? I think it's a bunch of poppycock. I mean, let, let's be real here. Iran is the biggest state sponsor of terrorism in the world. They have been complicit and funded Hamas every step of the way. They have supported them. So it doesn't matter if they were operationally no. giving a thumbs up to this. They no. are complicit no. directly. And, and, and it goes to the same point about the $6 billion. Okay, I think the administration misses the point on this. The $6 billion in unreleased funds. Sanctioned funds. Yes. Yes. In exchange for the release of five American hostages held in Iran. We traded hostages for prisoners. On top of that, the administration released $6 billion in sanctioned funds. So there Which was it already. Says is in a special account, can't be used for this. Right, but the problem is money is fungible. And it's not just the $6 billion. It's the lack of enforcement on sanctions on Iran, on the Palestinian Authority. The Taylor Force Act eliminated funds to the Palestinian Authority because they were engaged in pay to slay. They were paying Palestinians to kill Israelis and paying their families as a result. It's wrong. And if we as a, as a nation can't understand that, that's a problem. And so I look at this very simply. I, I railed against this in August. Really? When it was the, uh, the $6 billion okay. in August when it was initially announced. I railed against it on September 11th when the administration officially notified Congress. Think about that. September 11th, the greatest terrorist attack in the history of the United States, the administration notified Congress that they were releasing sanctioned funds to the greatest state sponsor of terror in the world. Are you nuts? And then two weeks ago, we had a hearing on the Taylor Force Act and I raised this very issue with the administration. Nothing. They defended it. Now, I'm not suggesting the, the $6 billion was used to fund this attack. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is you, uh, releasing sanctioned funds is idiotic. And gives Iran flexibility with money elsewhere. Correct. Let me ask you about your constituents. As you well know, Congressman Mike Lawler, most commercial flights in and out of Israel are either diminished or already been stopped. Yep. Do you want this administration to grant special access to other civilian planes or use military aircraft to get any American who wishes to leave under these circumstances out of that country? A thousand percent. Have you heard anything that I tells have, you this I, is going to happen? I have called the White House five times. I've spoken to the State Department. We've reached out to the Transportation Department. I've spoken to the airlines. The airlines are not going in at this moment for two reasons, the safety and security of their personnel. Understandable. And insurance factors. So unless the United States government is willing to indemnify uh, the airlines to send them in, obviously that's a challenge, which is why I've made it clear for two days, we need to send military aircraft in to begin evacuating American citizens. We have 600,000 American citizens in Israel at any given point. In my district alone, I have hundreds of citizens who are in Israel at this moment that are trying to get home. Now, not everybody is a dual citizen. Right. A lot of people live in the United States and they wanna come home. They're fearful. And that is why I've called on the administration to immediately get military aircrafts in private aircrafts, work with the commercial airlines, work with Congress. Once we elect a speaker, get let's indemnify this. the airlines so that they can get the planes in and get these people out. This is a war zone. It is a, it is a crisis to leave thousands of American citizens who want to come home in Israel at this moment. Mike Lawler, we're in his office. Segment four, The Takeout.
in one second. Even the most vile person that you can think of to behead 40 babies? Back to the Longworth House Office Building, late on this October 11th, uh, Mike Lawler, 17th District of New York, Republican Congressman, is our guest. You mentioned this, you said 19 hostages. You think there are 19 American hostages in Hamas's possession? Potentially. Uh, obviously, there, there's 19 missing Americans. Um, you have a fear that we have a fear the unaccounted that, that all they are, are in the are hands hostages. of Hamas. And look, that's a very dicey situation. You have a terrorist organization that literally beheaded babies, 40 babies. It, it's beyond words and comprehension. And I think obviously- Is that number that you just cited 40 reflection of information provided to members of Congress? Yeah. It, it, it's, it's disturbing. It's horrifying. I, you can't it's comp beyond comprehension. You can't comprehend that. No. The human I, mind I mean, can't look, work itself around e that. Even the most vile person that you could think of, to behead 40 babies? So I, 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 I'm deeply concerned uh, for, uh, obviously, the families uh, of those that lost their lives. Uh, but for the, the uh, 19 that are currently missing. Uh, and obviously, from my perspective, we want to do everything we can to make sure that those 19 come home and the thousands of American citizens that are currently in Israel come home expeditiously and safely. And we need to act quickly. So those hostages are American. There are many others who are Israeli. To what degree should that influence the pace, the magnitude of what is expected to be a ground operation into Gaza? Uh, they need to move expeditiously. Look. Who, to rescue or to invade? Uh, both. Okay. Look, you have a situation, uh, again, a terrorist organization that, frankly, has... has uh, violated its own people, the Palestinian people living in Gaza. Lives among them knowing that as Israel responds, as ever it has, there will be casualties. There will be casualties. There were and, civilians and innocents. And, and obviously we want to mitigate every potential civilian innocent casualty as possible. Nobody wants to see innocent people die. But you're dealing with a terrorist organization that believes Israel does not have a right to exist. So this is not a situation where we can just say, eh, it'll be fine. What they did, invading uh, Israel, killing and injuring thousands, including over 20 Americans, in the worst massacre of Jews, since the Holocaust mm -hmm. is unforgivable. And I think there needs to be a full understanding that there will be consequences to this. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, in war, there are casualties. None of us want that. None of us uh, wish for that. But it's a reality that we have to deal with. I wonder, Mike, if you were as stunned as most of the world was that vaunted institutions within Israel, Israeli Defense Forces and Israeli Intelligence Services, were so obviously and manifestly unprepared for this. Hours went by in various kibbutzim and places waiting for the Israeli Defense Forces Communications were disabled. It is now suggested through propaganda videos of Hamas that they use drones to disable communications facilities. This is a shocking thing for people who live in Israel. Is any of this on the doorstep of the Netanyahu government? 
Did it take its eye off Gaza? Was it more focused on the West Bank? Did it misread the situation? Its government said a few months ago Gaza was a place of stable instability. How much of this have, at all? I'm not saying blame, but historically, this is a country that is ready and makes itself ready. And one of the things I've gathered from reading that shocks Israelis is that it didn't feel like it was ready. What are your thoughts on that? Look, I think uh, when I think back to September 11th, I was a freshman in high school, fifth day of freshman year. And I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget the consequences of that day, the impact on my community living 25 miles from New York City. To today, we're still feeling the after effects, people dying from 9-11 uh, related illnesses. There's obviously uh, going to be a thorough examination of the information uh, that was available. Uh, there that, are credible that reports should have been acted on. That the Egyptians, um, at least at some level, communicated some things. Right. Be on the, the lookout. Something big is happening. We're, we're going to we're going to ha we're going to have to look through that. But at the end of the day, like with 9/11. There's only one group to blame, those that perpetrated the attack. And I think uh, in this instance, Hamas, backed by and funded by Iran, and back then Al-Qaeda. I think we need to keep our eye on the ball. I think we need to address uh, those that uh, acted in such a cowardly and barbaric way and eliminate them. And the time for, uh, you know, a review and, and uh, uh, accountability for those in leadership will come. But I, but, I, but I will say this. I met with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in May. And when he uh, met with Speaker McCarthy, myself, and others on the delegation, he made it very clear there's two reasons why he came back as prime minister. To prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon and to forge peace with Saudi Arabia. Which this was attack, developing. Which this was attack, developing. This attack. Talked about at the UN just a couple of weeks ago. This attack, uh, I believe, was intended to prevent any such normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel uh, and at the behest of Iran. Because it would have isolated Hamas, it would have strengthened Saudi Arabia, an arch enemy of Iran, even though they have diplomatic relations, they are not friends. They fought a proxy war in Yemen for seven years, if not longer, I, if I remember the number mm -hmm. correctly. And you believe this attack was at least in part, if not more than in part, motivated to scotch or undermine that potential deal between Israel and no, Saudi Arabia? No question. Do you think it'll succeed, or do you think Israel no. and Saudi Arabia will f push through on that? Not no. immediately, but Look, over time. It's going to take time to get us back on the right path here. But the United States stands firmly with Israel. Uh, my first bill that I passed was to create a special envoy for the Abraham Accords because I believe in the Abraham Accords. I believe in the purpose of the Abraham Accords. If we want to forge peace in the Middle East, we must normalize relations between Israel and Arab majority nations and create prosperity, shared prosperity in the region. Iran does not care for that. They don't want that. And they will use every proxy at their disposal uh, to avoid that. That's the voice of Mike Lawler, our special guest. Stay tuned for the takeout and I'll take a special. That's next. I want a robust discussion. I want people that are focused on the future, uh, not the past, not 2020. Welcome to the Takeout Outtake Especial, Mike Lawler, freshman Republican from the 17th District of New York. That includes Chappaqua, which means the Clintons are constituents of the good congressman. Um, 
Donald Trump going to be the Republican nominee? We'll see. Uh, okay, you know, on, you can do better than that. No, look, well, I think obviously you look at the challenges facing this country. Um, I think people want a leader. They want someone who's going to address the problems and not just focus on their own per personal petty grievances. What does the Republican Party want based uh, on your Look, I, I think obvi obviously Donald Trump is the front runner. There's no question about that. But I think um, when, I, when I talk to folks, people, people are tired of the drama. They're tired of the, the personal petty stuff. They really do want somebody who's focused on solving who's the that? problems. Look, I've uh, honestly, in this, in this primary so far, I've been impressed with Nikki Haley. Will Hurd dropped out of the race this week and said she's the one who has momentum and Republicans should coalesce behind Nikki Haley. Are you ready? Uh, look, I'm going to let the process play itself out. I'm not, I'm not getting involved in it. I'm focused on the job that I was elected mm -hmm. to do. Um, but I, what I've said repeatedly over the course of, of this year is I want a robust discussion. I want people that are focused on the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, not the past, not 2020, mm -hmm. uh, but, but want to address the problems that we're dealing with from spending to the border to China. Obviously, we have crises in Israel and Ukraine. These are real challenges, and the focus has to be on that. If Trump is the nominee, will you support him? Uh, look, I, I want a Republican president because I think Joe Biden has failed miserably on a number of mm -hmm. issues, uh, especially our border. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the spending is out of control. Five trillion dollars in new spending. If no, he's but the nominee, will you support him? I, I haven't decided yet. Okay. But, I, but, I, but I want to see the country move in a different direction. And I, and I think it's important. I, I really do think it's important put personalities aside, put uh, uh, party aside. We need leadership in this country. We're failing in, in many respects because we don't have leaders. Mm -hmm. We don't have people who are willing to uh, make the tough decisions okay. uh, and, and make and the tough And face harsh realities, even unpleasant ones. Unpleasant ones. So let me ask no you question. this. Ken Buck, one of your colleagues, said today that he, in the conference meeting, Mm -hmm. asked Jim Jordan and Steve Scalise a very simple question. Yep. Did Joe Biden win the 2020 presidential election, or some variation of that? If you remember the exact quote, please mm -hmm. tell me. Neither of them gave him a straight answer. Is that what happened? Uh, I have said repeatedly, Joe Biden won the election. Right. And I think it's incumbent on leaders in our party to accept the reality. Ken Buck is not misdescribing what happened, is he? No. That's what happened? Yep. What does that tell you? It's frustrating at times. More, it's frustrating. Is it, is it just frustrating? Look, I, I, I said, I said uh, January 6th. That was the first day uh, in the New York State Assembly for me. I got elected in 2020. And I was in the chambers didn't know what was happening in Washington. I was focused on what was happening in Albany. And when I heard what happened, I was the first Republican in the state to condemn it. Because it was wrong. Never should have happened. And I think we have to, to focus again on the future, on the issues. Joe Biden won. The American people spoke. You have to accept that and move on. And live to campaign and prevail another day. Look, the, the, what, what makes our country great, what makes our country different, uh, is that peaceful transfer of power. You have several Ronald Reagan books on your shelf. He said in the second paragraph of his inaugural address in 1981, it is nothing short of a miracle. No question. He's my favorite president. And he always will be. Mike Lowe, thanks for your time. We didn't get to the three threshold questions. We'll come back and have a conversation with you sometime in the future, and we'll ask those questions then. I'm Major Garrett. We'll see you next week.